Um, remember, we are looking at a video from New York around 1900, and notably, this is one of the early earliest forms of video, earliest uh, subjects documented with video. A fitting subject for a modern tool, which is New York City. I'm sure all of you have been to New York City. And when you think about New York City, remember, it's notable because it is a modern city, unlike the cities of Europe and other parts of Asia. It was born in the 20th, 19th century with all of the commensurate, uh, all of the included uh, modern attributes, um, aspects such as electricity, steam engines. So let's take a look at how New York City looked in 1900. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's good, you can read that. So notably, probably a lot of our great grandparents arrived, not all, but a lot of our great grandparents arrived in the late 1800s. I know mine did, Italian, Irish, whatnot. So this would probably be the New York City they saw when your great grandparents, if they arrived in this time period, this would be what they saw when they arrived. And who knows, we might even see them on the boat or whatever in this footage. So see if you recognize any of your uh, relatives. <laughs> You can see everything all right, Mark? Yeah. Not much going on. Yet. Not much going on yet, right? Life was pretty slow back then. Let's jump ahead and see Sabora. I'll just, I just kind of want it doesn't, we don't need to dwell on long, I just want you to look at the people and think about how they might compare to the world today. Clearly we've got families arriving, kids, wives, different kind of clothing than that you might expect. These guys over there on the left are kind of watching them arrive, sort of like with their modern hat, kind of, you know, just checking out the new arrivals. And let's jump ahead and see some more footage from the city itself. You can see people, even, even these newly arrived immigrants, there's a formality to the dress. Um, it's almost like they're dressing, they're putting on their nice outfit to arrive to this new location. And the formality is pretty notable. Um, and I would like you guys to consider that as it relates to what we saw with the clothing um, in one of the Impressionist paintings last week. I'll skip ahead to some more footage. And this is pretty low quality footage, which we would expect from seeing the earliest versions of the video cameras. And let's take a look at a modern skyscraper, which is notable because it's built with modern tools like steel and iron. This is the flat iron. And this would be a marvel to people 100 years ago. To us, it's like whatever, um, because it defies gravity seemingly. It's built higher than anything we've ever seen before. You know, it's much higher than the Hagia Sophia. And again, note the way people are dressed. There's a police officer, look at that. Um, it's clearly a windy day, but much more formal, a much more formal world than the world we live in today. Um, and people are all wearing clothing made, in, made through industrial means, as in made, made in a factory. Probably a lot of these immigrants will end up working in a factory, like my grandfather. And now all the factories are shipped overseas. So they've kind of gone <laughs> to all the countries, other countries. The fact the people came, the factories left. And that's just, of course, because of fluctuating cost of labor. And here you can see people are probably getting together to do some sort of immigration um, work or maybe they're protesting. But that's enough for us just to kind of get a glimpse at the way people look uh, from this period, even, you know, still horses wandering down the street. So, uh, Mark, are you there? Yeah. So, what's your impression of uh, of New York City from 1900? How do they compare to us? Well, there's still a lot of them. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of people. <laughs> there's still, still a lot lots of, people. of people running around everywhere. Um, it looks like they still have the same kind of buildings um, that they do today. Yeah, and and that's yeah, that's a, a testament to the fact that they they stick around. Like, the brick and mortar doesn't really get replaced as quickly. Um, right. Do you see this, uh, I can't say if it says the world or something. Is that what that says, the world? 
on the right there in the. I think so. Is that a newspaper? Yeah, that's my guess. They're all gathering around to grab the newspaper to read the news. And I can remember, you know, up until maybe 2006, I would go to the cafe, get the newspaper, get the New York Times, open it up, and it was great. It was, it was, it was like it wasn't even for information necessarily because you could watch TV, but there was something nice about kind of reading a lot of things that were sort of fresh and new. You couldn't control it. It was just sort of. And now the difference is you have total control over, like, oh, I don't like that. I don't like that. And in a way, you kind of just took what you were given back then. Um, and that maybe sounds horrible because you would rather have the choice. And yet there was something nice about sort of having your news curated and rather than being able to just sort of, okay, I want that and that and that and that. Um, but you can see that even here, uh, the news is a very important part of kind of staying informed and, and being part of a community, especially knowing that World War One is on the horizon and there is still a kind of, um, a destabilized world or an unstable world compared, I'd say, to today. Um, Mark, what about their clothing? It looks, it looks a lot more like burly. Like it looks like they're wearing a lot more like heavy type clothing. Yeah, and it's not even like winter. It clearly, it's not like super cold out. Um, here we are, East River, 1903. In, oh, I guess here are their informal tires, so notably informal tire, but. For me, it's, it's not too different. The only thing perhaps is maybe the coat is a little heavier, the hats are a little more prim and proper, but I don't see too much of a difference compared to this and the other outfits people are wearing. Now, of course, it's not in color, but I think, would you agree, Mark, it seems like people dressed a little more formally back then? Yeah, of course. So I think we could segue then from there back to uh, maybe here, assuming you can see this. And I think that's similar to what we might see. We saw this picture, I think, the other day, right, Mark? Yeah. Yeah, so the formal attire is really, I think, something notable about this era. And we talked about how this is very much the product of an industrialized world, which makes it easier to buy things like clothing, like food, like cars, eventually. And that blurs a lot of the social boundaries, which were preserved through the appearance of sort of high class. And I think the artist here is capturing a little bit of that um, transformation, the outward transformation of people, and maybe even subconsciously sort of noting something bizarrely uh, not social about it. People seem very distant, and they seemed a lot like they were having a lot more fun in the video we just saw, um, like more kind of socializing. So I think that for me even makes this picture seem all the more kind of like maybe the artist is noting there's something emerging about the modern life, which is we are very comfortable, but we're very isolated from each other. We don't have the same kind of bonds holding us together. We're connected more through media and through pop culture than we are through family and uh, religion, for instance. So we don't see any religious paintings, do we, anymore? I mean, what this, this picture here, uh, if I can, oops, my screen sharing paused. Did that pause? So you, what we might have seen as a, a church before, now we see very secular pictures that have no religious, um, overtly religious messages whatsoever, um, such as this Monet. And again, Impressionism is very much a response to photography. Um, let me uh, pick up someone else here. Uh, Tanya, are you there? Thanks, Mark. So did you remember what I said about how Impressionism relates to photography the other day, assuming you were here and assuming I said that? And assuming you um, remember? I might not have watched the lecture yet because remember I leave early. That's so okay. So, so photography, do you remember what is valuable about photography versus painting, Tanya? Was that something you got a, a chance to hear? Um, I'm just going to take a guess here. Um, for photography, you're like you're actually capturing like a an actual instance in time of like people, and then like this, you kind of like a painting, you kind of add what you want. That, yeah, and that's another way of describing the terms we were talking about, which is objectivity and subjectivity, mm -hmm. right? If anyone doesn't know those terms, listen up. Objectivity means factual, and subjectivity means opinion. So in a newspaper. The front, uh, is the front page, Tanya, is that, is the front page news, is that objective or subjective? 
on a newspaper? Yeah. Um, I'd say subjective. No, it's actually objective. I'm glad you, really? I brought that up because when we think about news, you can think about objectivity as the facts, like who, what, why, when, and where. This happened to this person on this date at this location because of this versus subjectivity would be which part of the newspaper would be subjective, do you think, Tanya? Um, like the, I know there's a, there's a column where they do like <coughs> people just like their opinions on stuff. And all Great, that. right. Of the columns or the editorials as they're often called, which would probably usually be towards the end in the back. And that area is designated for um, editorial. And I think what you guys might uh, notice is the news on TV is all editorial. It's not, and some of it is objective. Some of it is, here's what happened and da, da, da. But most of the news has become very editorial based. So it's important when you think about the terms objective and subjective that it relates to journalism in terms of what is the who, what, why, when, and where factual elements is objective, but opinions is subjective. And it relates to painting and art in terms of photography, video being objective, because it provides you the factual evidence, who, what, why, when, and where, where subjectivity gives you how we feel about it or a sense of a place. And now going back to the question of photography. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, Ryan, I have Iverson. Are you there? Yeah. So do you remember what we were talking about with how impressionism relates to photography? Um, yeah, I think so. so. I think um, what we said was like, it like kind of makes what some of the things like they seem real and it's like kind of natural. Yeah, think about impressionism as a response to photography. You can see this sort of, this new slide here. Photography provides an objective truth, if you will, about the world. So, and it provides it with a lot more crisp accuracy. I think we can all agree that photography is, is the tool we use to, to, to capture our image online. There's no doubt about that. We all have used photography for Instagram, Facebook, Etc. So in the early years of photography, painters at that time were still the medium, the tool that people use when someone famous wanted to hire you to capture their picture or to paint their picture. But then photography became the more accurate medium. So what painters do in response to the existence of this new tool for capturing accuracy is they do with painting what you can't do with photography, which would be become extremely subjective in um, uh, access and celebrate and deepen the uh, complete subjectivity of painting uh, because that's something photography can't do. Photography can't capture a bridge with its sort of, it won't necessarily capture the, the feeling of that air of summertime. Um, it won't capture the sort of the mood or the tone necessarily as well as a painting might. So. Is it clear, Ryan, how impressionism is a response to photographies being so objective and so much more accurate? Yeah. Is, I, that, is that clear how, like, how painters basically say, okay, if, if, if photography is here and, that, and, it's better, and photography is better at capturing the world more accurately, well then, as a painter, what I'll do is I won't try to compete with that. I'm going to do what painting can do that photography can't do, which is capture the world with total subjectivity, with total sort of liberty, right? Yeah, is, is right. Clear? So what you yeah. see is that evolves even further into post-impressionism, whereas instead of sort of trying to capture the impression of a location in a very subjective sort of personal way um, with color as a sort of vibrating element, um, but without any sense of accuracy per se, uh, we get post-impressionists who really take that and run with it. And you can see that here with Vincent Van Gogh, Van Gogh, whatever you want to call him, who's, uh, I said we we're going to leave Europe, but we're going to go back to Europe for a moment. And you could see his impressionistic brushstroke throughout the sort of, uh, his, he has no interest in sort of connecting the dots here. He's leaving everything sort of fast and loose as far as the brushwork. Um, and he's doing that intentionally. Before this, in another era, we never probably would have seen an artist leave a painting so, quote, unfinished. And yet Van Gogh, Van Gogh decided, well, why not? 
And let me ask you guys, uh, what is the value of seeing, um, clearly Van Gogh's decided, okay, this, there's some value here. Uh, Jocelyn, can you hear me okay? Yeah. What do you think of, why do you think uh, Van Gogh decided to leave these paintings the way he did? Why, what's the value of sort of seeing so much of his brushwork? Mm, I think it gives it like originality and like gave him his own style. Yeah, that's a great answer. Um, think about photography. If 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 you had if he had photographed himself right here, right? If this was just a selfie with a photograph, would it be original? Yes. As in, I mean, it, would it be? Um, is it something that someone else could also do? Could could I take a photo of him? Could someone else take this a photo from this location of him? And it, would, would the photo look any different than the other photo? Um, no. Right, because a photo is a photo is a photo, right? It doesn't matter who's taking it. But Vincent van Gogh is the only person who can paint this painting of himself, right? As you yes. said, it's very original, right? So one thing you should notice is when an artist leaves, and I think, Kent Jocelyn, have you ever painted before? Have you ever used a, a paintbrush? Yes. Right, so everyone knows, I assume, that a paintbrush sort of, you put the paint on the canvas, and all those little marks you can see on his face, and every, every inch of the canvas, you can see the mark of the artist, which is to say he didn't hide the paintbrush. He left it there. And I think one of the reasons, as Jocelyn kind of said, he left it there is there's an originality. And I think that originality partly corresponds to the fact that we can see the, like, almost the human body at work here to make the painting, which is to say it's almost like a recording of Vincent van Gogh's hand movement as he applied the paint. Do you follow what I mean by that, Jocelyn? Yes. So it's, it's almost more deeply human. It's almost like Vincent van Gogh is in the picture as the subject, but also his hand. We can feel his hand moving around the canvas, like adding thicker brush strokes on his, on his forehead, um, the way his hand moves to paint the fluffy part of his, his head hat, whatever that is. So he's, you can almost feel the energy of his hand movement. Um, let me see, see me up there. You can feel the energy of his hand movement as he's painting, you know, down strokes, uh, circles, thinner, harder, and all of that is a recording of the person, the artist, and he's involved in the making of the picture. Whereas with a camera, with a picture, you just point and shoot and snap. And that's the only sort of involvement of your body in the picture and you don't see, even see that so one thing i think makes it highly original jocelyn is the fact that he is leaving his sort of a record of his process in which he which he used to create it in the painting in the final product itself uh is, does that make sense jocelyn i don't know if that's a little too complicated or too artsy yeah it makes sense and so there's a certain value i think to that in the sense that he is allowing his own auto, it's an autobiographical painting, right? It's a self-portrait, right? So he is the expert on himself. So it's only fitting that the subject is actually involved. You could see the involvement of his hand in making his painting, right? So that's one key part of Van Gogh is he's almost welcoming the originality of his, of his uh, lack of precise, his, his lack, his, his imperfect humanity, right? where the, the imperfection of the mark is, is something he loves and, and, and enjoys. And a camera has nothing imperfect about it. There's no uh, mistakes. It captures what it sees and that's what, it, what is there. Whereas here, it's almost like he's struggling. There's almost a, a he's struggling to bring out him, his, his picture um, in a way that is fitting to his own personality. Um, Jocelyn, so let me ask you another question. What is, uh, is there anything that some people might say, wow, this is, the, I don't like this painting. And if so, what might that, what might be that thing they might not like? And it could be the brush strokes, but what's something else besides that, that might be distasteful to uh, people, the public who are used to seeing the kind of art we've seen up to now. And then this, they see this. Um, all like the contrasting colors. And can you like be, more, uh, yeah, be more specific. Oh, that's a great answer. Um, like the color of the face and then like the bright blue hat. And then yeah, like the tell background. Me, uh, tell me specifically what color's on the face. Um, 
Well, it has like a light, it's like a mix of like white and yellow for like the skin and then like a darker yellow for the eyebrows and then just bright green for the eyes. And then there's like a purple highlight, a violet, or maybe it's say that's a, uh, I call that a, like a, light, like a white purple. Um, yeah, violet maybe for his, for right here. And you can see like, just look at my face. There are different colors. You could call this like purple maybe and red but certainly not the kind of highlights that you see in this picture. And why is he doing that, Jocelyn? Um, I don't know, probably just to make it more original in his own yeah, again. Yeah, again, think, think about it in relationship to photography. Does photography do this? Can photography do this without Photoshop? No. no. So in a way, this is once again, he is saying, he is saying, Wow, this this is what you can do with painting. Look at look at and it's totally unique and maybe even distasteful, but it's absolutely and I'm not saying that's why he did it, but I'm saying that one reason why the impressionist movement emerges in the first place is because there's sort of a, an opportunity for artists to continue being artists with painting as we've seen they've been for many centuries, but they don't want to compete with photography which will do it much better. So they're doing things that you can really do that are unique to painting, which is sort of this impressionism. And we'll see, it becomes very abstract. Um, but sticking on this picture for a moment, yeah, Jocelyn, that hat is pretty crazy, right? You notice the brush strokes, even on the fuzzy part, it's very like, adds some energy. And I'd say the one other thing that we haven't talked about as far as in terms of, the, or, or in addition to color and that brush stroke is, would you say that the brush stroke adds a certain energy, like internal energy to the painting, Jocelyn? Yeah. Yeah, and I think, you know, I'll say set that answer up. And you could see, I think that compared to maybe, let's say here, there's no internal energy in the painting. The artist is trying to capture what we see here like it were a photograph. He's trying to accurately capture the subject here without imposing his own brush stroke or her brush stroke here to sort of uh, transform the subject. Whereas here, you can really see that energy within the painting. And it comes from the mark of the, the hand, almost like the mark of the artist almost humanizes the painting more, makes it more like accessible, more like a kid, like a, a playful uh, feeling of a child. And do you feel that childlike aspect here at all, uh, Jocelyn? Yeah. Especially where, what's the, what are the key childlike aspects of it? Um like the the background like that i don't know if that's like a picture but like with the three other people in it like I mean, that looks real childlike well i mean more like if you're a kid when you when you when you make marks with crayons right for instance like how is this kind of like a kid's painting or a kid's a drawing a kid would do with, with crayons if at all like it's this for me feels more like a, I'm not saying a kid could do this, but it's closer to something the way a kid might draw than, for instance, you know, this, right? Yeah. So what about this has sort of like that childlike accessibility, like? Probably just the strokes and the color. Yeah, exactly what we've been talking about. Like little kids wouldn't bother mixing the colors as much. You can't with a crayon, right? It's almost like he's left the white Crayola the white and the yellow Crayola the yellow and didn't mix them and just left them as little bits of color. And the mark of a crayon is very similar to what we see here. So, so I think it's the same kind of like, I don't care, I'm gonna color. I'm gonna draw with my crayons. And there's a certain, you could say, oh, that's disgusting, that's like a kid. But you could also say that's wonderful, that's like a kid. I feel very like, I feel cool that someone in the world is enjoying painting in a new way. Um, so keep that in mind. And now let's go to the back there, what Jocelyn was talking about. What do we see there, Jocelyn? This is the last question for you, I promise. So what do we see there in the background? Um, I don't know. It looks like, like a painting. Like yes. another painting. So it's like a painting within a painting. Good. So let's, let me pick out someone else there, is it because you've done a good job. Thank you. Uh, Ryan Gilly, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. So what's, we've, discussed, we've decided that's a painting within a painting in the background. What are we looking at there? Um, it looks like a couple more people, maybe a mountain and trees in the background. Right, so we got a few people in the foreground. It looks like maybe two, maybe three, and a mountain in the background. 
And what we are actually looking at is a picture from Japan. Does anyone know what mountain that is in the back in Japan, in Tokyo? I've actually been on that mountain. Anyone know? Famous mountain in Tokyo? Starts with an S? Fuji? Fuji, yes, Mount Fuji. So why do you think Vincent Van Gogh has a picture of presumably Japanese people in the foreground, a, maybe a wall poster, probably from Japan and his room in Europe? Uh, Ryan, why do you think he does? <laughs> um, maybe he was maybe there and painted this painting. I'm really close. Not. No, that's great. That would be a logical conclusion. You're on the right track. But in fact, he bought one of those posters from his boy here, his buddy here, who sells these things. And it is, I don't know if you guys had the same thing when I went to college back in whenever. <laughs> so that there's always someone selling posters for the college dorm rooms. Do you guys still have that? Like posters in the, in, the, in the bookstore, they're selling posters. To, and they're always like, you know, celebrities, Bob Dylan, Che Guevara. Do they still do that on campus? Apparently not. Yeah, I've seen posters in the bookstore. Yeah, so, and when I, I think back in the day, it was a little, maybe they don't want kids putting their, cluttering the rooms up with it, but it was very common to like decorate your room with posters, right? And these posters are an example of exotic pictures from, the Far East from, remember, a lot of art history and a lot of history of the world is an effort to bridge the gap between the West and China. And you could say that's an ongoing project. And this is part of it where you see uh, street vendors selling pictures, posters from China to decorate your apartment with. It's not unlike something you would probably see at Ikea, right? Some sort of, ooh, that's some sort of exotic uh, from here or from there. And it's not too unlike the world we have today where we import things from afar and we impress our neighbors, impress our, our, our guests with, ooh, look at this great new table from Ikea and look at this neat poster from wherever, right? So there's, a, there's something familiar about this world because they're almost consumers of sort of global culture, right? And Van Gogh is actually one of these consumers and he consumed one of these posters, which is say he bought it, and he painted the picture here in the background. Now that's sort of the literal ex explanation for why that poster is there. What is the other explanation for that, for why he put that picture in the back? And I'll give you a hint, um, and uh, let me switch to someone else. Uh, Megan, are you there? Yes. Hi, Megan. So, and thank you, Ryan. So here's one of Vincent Van Gogh's earliest paintings, or earlier paintings. And how does this painting compare to one of his later paintings like this one? It's a lot darker and gloomier. So this painting's more darker and gloomier than this one, right? Yes. And do you mean that just in terms of the color? Yes, and the way he structured the people's faces too. And what do you mean by that? Like their faces I f are more weirdly shaped than yeah, the other yeah. person. Yeah, and you can, uh, so color, there's sort of almost like a, it's almost like the brush stroke that he's using in this era is he's using it on the faces and it gives them that sort of almost, almost I wanna say like medieval look, like where they're like almost reinforces like a sense of downtroddenness, like their faces are worn down by by, by hard work and labor perhaps, right? Um, yeah. So night and day, right? Night and yes. day. Um, so something happens between here and here with Vincent Van Gogh and here, right? Something, something dramatic changes in his painting interests. Um, and before we get there, let's take a look at this painting for just a moment because I think it's a really important painting. Because again, we're probably looking at the equivalent of what are a lot of our great grandparents and or maybe even their great great grandparents did and, and look like in that day. And maybe these are recent immigrants or, or people who might emigrate to the United States because these actually are people in Europe, but they're eating potatoes. Does anyone know where potatoes come from? Where were potatoes? Uh, Megan, do you know where potatoes are from? Potato plants. The store. Do you know where potatoes originally came from? Maybe? Ireland. No, but that's, I'm glad you said that because that's probably where roughly maybe where they are 
I do know you, that's good you know that the Irish potato famine happened. Oddly enough, the New World, as in the place Columbus accidentally discovered, discovered, uh, is the origin of potatoes. And so you could see that exchange between the New World was is sort of a deep exchange of people, of, of diseases, but also crops like potatoes, which became a staple to people like the ones we see in this picture. And that also caught, imperiled them because when there was a potato blight, it caused a big, big famine. And that triggered a lot of Irish to leave uh, Europe and go to the United States. So this picture is a picture of poor people eating potatoes, but it's sort of a picture of, of history because they're eating something which you would never would have eaten in Europe 300 years, let's see, 400 years earlier. You follow, Megan? Yes. And what is there, what's the thing that she's pouring on the right? Maybe tea. Or it looks maybe even like coffee. Um, and either of the, whether it's tea or coffee, neither of those was grown in Europe. Those are both from India or the New World or Africa. So you can see, even though they're poor, they're eating food and drinking stuff that is very much the byproduct of that Colombian exchange between Columbus and the New World and sort of all, everything that came in the wake of these two continents meeting. Now, Megan, tell me about, uh, well, let's talk about these people. Are they high class or are they low class? They look like they're low class. And what makes, what is uh, decidedly low class about them? And I don't, there's nothing negative about that, by the way. It's just, uh, we're all talking about what we see here. Um, maybe like their clothes and then it looks like they're really um, condensed in the area. So it looks like a small house. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and we, did you see the video we saw a moment ago? Yes. And I, I think I remember the woman wearing something like a headpiece kind of thing, like some sort of bonnet. I don't know what you call a shawl. But it's, these probably could be like the same kind of people we saw on the boat. Maybe they put on their one coat or the one dress for the arrival for the video, right? But this is yeah. the same kind of era of people. And, and what does Vincent Van Gogh want us to think about these people, Megan? Maybe that they're sad. Go on. Because it's dark. Okay. And um, what, what time of day do you think it is? Maybe nighttime. What, and what tells us that? That they have a light on and it's a really dark room. Right. So it could be late at night and maybe they've, it's, it's late. And, and, and maybe if they're drinking coffee, that could be maybe they're waking up and it's really dark out still. I don't know which, honestly. But they're definitely sort of a sense of like it's either really early in the morning and they're getting ready for work and they're eating, or it's really late at night, so late that it's the sun's already down and they're kind of getting their meal in because they've worked so long all day that they couldn't eat until the day's over, right? So either of those still implies that they, are, they work really hard, right? Yes. And how, and oh, by the way, I think uh, in a moment, I'm gonna have to call you guys back. Um, so maybe let's do that now. And Megan, I'm gonna pick up where we left off with you, okay? Okay. All right. So just uh, check your email, guys, and I'll send you an invite in just a moment.